Hello. Um, this presentation is as part of a series entitled, Why is there so little relief from musculoskeletal problems? Or why is the level of disability so high in the population for musculoskeletal disease? An important answer to that qu these questions are the kinetic chain. You cannot treat musculoskeletal disease without understanding the kinetic chain. And we strongly recommend our patients before coming to the clinics, see this video and at least the neuromuscular dysfunction video. These lectures are educational and not intended to manage individual patients. They are not a substitute for patients seeing healthcare professionals. Among the reasons for our patients vary and no brief presentation substitutes for formal training. Our goals are to increase function with age, to non-surgically uh, restore function with injury, injury prevention, and fitness. My name is Mark Brzezinski, and my uh, background has been talked about in previous vi videos and on the webpage. This presentation is going to contains four parts. First, I want to give a general definition of the kinetic chain. Second, though the back is more relevant, I, we're going to talk about knee problems first because it's generally easier for people to appreciate. Finally, I want to go into gait. We're going to spend a lot of time in all the videos on gait because it is the most important functional movement, but it also is a tremendous source of diagnostic information. Anything from hamstring and uh, a flexor muscle strength to B12 deficiency to Parkinson's disease. Now, I'm using this video as an analogy before we get into the kinetic chain. This is a photograph of houses in a glacier lake in Pennsylvania. It's actually the largest natural lake in Pennsylvania. It's where the continents collide. And so houses here have problems with their foundation. And we're going to use the foundation as being analogous to the back. Now, the reasons they have problems with their foundation is because um, the water coming off these hills is coming down at an incredible at a high speed and wind is very strong particularly when the jet stream drops to the level of the lake so you can continue patching the foundation or you can fix the problem you can divert the water and you can divert the wind from the houses which is the way people deal with it but this is patching is analogous to the way most musculoskeletal problems are treated. The kinetic chain for the purposes of this discussion means that all joints, bones, muscles, and ligaments in the weight and force bearing system can't be viewed in isolation. For example, when looking at the spine, all these components from the foot to the spine affect each other. I'm going to use a common example case. This is a, a patient who walks in with a painful knee. They get the traditional orthopedic exam, and from the previous lectures, you know that there is no internal medicine component that led to orthopedics. Orthopedics is a discipline without a medical origin. The patient gets an MRI, which generally finds something, and in this case, it turns out to be a meniscal tear, whether that was the cause of the pain or not. The patient gets meniscal surgery. After the surgery, you hope they at the very least get improvement from the physical therapy this patient got minimal relief and the problem is now if the patient had gotten a complete exam a functional movement exam a test like a single leg squat would have been done and these are the results you can see that the knee is um, unstable and this is due to problems at the ankle and or hip and it's not due to problems with the knee itself. So in this case traditional exams and which are focused on the knee and not the whole kinetic chain and MRI which is generally shows an abnormality of some kind yielded the wrong diagnosis. So the knee can be de considered a dependent joint. It's dependent on the hip muscles 
and the ankle muscles. In addition, it's dependent on neuromuscular coordination between the knee and the hip and also proprioception. If you look at ACL injuries in skiers, for instance, one common thing they'll tell you is they were looking away. And in this particular case, it's very common that they don't have proprios good proprioception. They know where their joint is in space. Um, I generally tell skiers they should be able to stand on one leg with their eyes closed for 10 to at least 10, probably 20 seconds because otherwise you need your eyes to tell you where your leg is. If you can only do that for two seconds when you turn your head while you're skiing in this example, then your muscles fire inappropriately because they don't know where the leg is exactly in space and the tibia can move in a different direction than the femur leading to an ACL injury. Now we're going to talk about closed kinetic chain here, which generally means that you're on the ground uh, you're attached to the ground rather than in midair, and the axial skeleton refers to the main skeleton rather than the limbs. Now, this image was generated using a kinesiology program. So, all we did was invert the ankle. And what is the body response, response to inverting the ankle or turning it in? The knee moves inward, the hip drops down but the spine gets a C or bend in it. And so you can see that if this patient is walking, there's going to be tremendous forces, inappropriate forces, across all the major joints. In the case of the back, the left side of the image is contracting to try to pull the, muscle, the spine back in place. The right side ligaments and other tissues are being stretched. So in this image, we're going to look at the three components that are most common causes of back pain. And these are anterior tilt of the pelvis, posterior tilt of the pelvis, or lateral tilt of the pelvis. Remember, the, in general, the pelvis is fused to the spine. So if we look at the upper left, if the pelvis is tilt anteriorly, and this is Sitter's disease as well as the next image, B. In this case, the anterior tilt is due to tight flexor muscles, the quads and ilius psoas. It results in a backward C shape known as lordosis, excessive lordosis. And so if we look below at the vertebral bodies, what this does is it causes um, collapse of the vertebral bodies in, in the back posteriorly. Now the space where the ner spinal nerves comes out gets smaller. Patients love to come into the office saying, I have a disc, I have a disc, I have a disc. Well, pretty much everybody does after a certain age. And in actuality, probably very little discs form after the age of 35. And so why is this disc suddenly causing symptoms? Well, in this case, now you have a very tight space where the disc is up against the spinal nerve. And that could be one reason. The green arrow points to another reason for that, what we just talked about is a reason for potential sciatic pain. The green arrow shows why you would get pain in the back because you're stretching the ligaments on the front. The reddish area on the ligament is being stretched and as you walk each time it stretches. So now if we go to the upper right, we're looking at um, two tight extensors like the hamstrings, which leads to a posterior tilt and this is called kyphosis. It's a C-shape of the spine. And now if we look at what happens at the level of the vertebrae, now the ligaments in between the spinal processes on the vertebrae get stretched. And so these are a source of pain. The discs themselves have minimal nerve endings, but we also see the disc as the arrow in D shows of the disc in blue is pushing toward the spinal column. So when a patient with spinal stenosis, if their hip does this, then it's going to tighten the spinal canal and worsen their spinal stenosis. So that's anterior and posterior tilting of the hip. If we look to the right, we go back to the image we saw on the previous slide. This is lateral tilting of the hip. And we see, again, muscles are firing on one side, ligaments are being stretched on the opposite side. Now, when you were walking during heel contact, but particularly during um, 
as you enter mid stance where you have the maximal impact force, you can have two to five times your body weight shooting up through these joints. And if you continuously do that a thousand times a day, is it any wonder you have chronic problems in the back? So the problem, the main mechanism, isn't in the back, but where the pain is located is in the back. So you have a disc, but that's not the major problem. Now, gait is critical. And so the image on the left is just to emphasize gait is the most important functional movement we do. It's complex, and you really need to be able to assess it. It's a great diagnostic tool, and you have to have very good mechanics or else it affects pretty much every joint on the body. I saw one case where somebody had an abnormal gait. It affected the vertebrae up in their neck, the patient's neck, and they had C2 compression at the top of the head that their physicians originally thought was herpes of the scalp, and it was numbness from compression of a cervical nerve. Now, the image on the right we see on the is seen over the internet commonly, and it's reasonably correct, but it's useful for the demonstration here. First point I want to make is walking and running, just like a golf swing or throwing a baseball, the energy comes from rotation. So we start externally rotated, outwardly rotated, our leg complex. Then as you go into mid-stance, you internally rotate and you absorb, if you're doing it correctly, like approximately in the middle column, you absorb all the energy from gravity in your muscle groups, in the plantar fascia, in your butt muscles. And then as you tow off, then you release that energy to push the go forward. You're not really pulling yourself forward. You're using eccentric contraction and gravity for most of, um, of your gait. Now, if you look at the left, they call it under pronation in this slide, the person is running, is walking along the side of the foot. Here, this is the solid side of the foot. It doesn't really absorb energy. So all that ground reaction force, that force of gravity, is shooting straight up through your uh, weight-bearing system, through your knees, through your hips, into your back. On the opposite side, they're riding too far on the inside of their foot and among the problems is with the overstretching the plantar fascia and um, the uh, uh, Achilles tendon issues. The kinetic chain of the shoulder will be addressed with uh, neurodynamic function in the neurodynamic function lecture by Dr. Maria Rupnik. It's really hard to completely separate the kinetic chain from uh, neurodynamic dysfunction. Uh, so joints, muscles, tendons, and ligaments can't be evaluated in isolation of the rest of the kinetic chain. There's also a student video that's going to be attached with this one. Uh, a pre-med student here, she is going to present the um, um, kinetic chain of the back using a um, manual model. Um, I hope people like it, the students trying to get into medical school. These lectures are, edu are educational and not intended to manage patients. They are not a substitute for patients seeing healthcare professionals. Among the reasons are patients vary and no brief presentation substitutes for formal training.